Thank you uh, very much, Ingo, for uh, leading the award ceremony. And now I want to invite uh, Professor Marcelo Mena to give the first plenary of the Steves Conference, uh, the fourth uh, Latin American Steves uh, Conference. Uh, Professor Mena, uh, Marcelo Mena Carrasco, he's a biochemical civil engineer from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso. He holds a Master of Science and a PhD degree in Environmental Engineering from the University of Iowa in the US. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the MIT Joint Program of Science and Policy uh, of Global Change in 2011, and he was also a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the California State University in Fresno. In 2014, Dr. Mena was appointed as the, as the Subsecretary of the Environment, and in 2017, he became the Minister of Environment of Chile under the President uh, Michel Bachelet. Uh, Dr. Mena also served as the Manager of Research and an Analysis on the Climate Change at the World Bank. Dr. Mena also acts as the Director of the Climate Action Center at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Paraíso, and he's currently the Chief Sec Executive Officer of the Global Methane Hub. Uh, Dr. Mena's research focuses on estima uh, estimating the externalities of biofuels, power generation, transportation, and residential heating. His research has been published in journals like Nature Climate Change, Science, Atmospheric Environment, and Environmental Science and Technology, among other uh, journals. Through his research, he has advocated for renewable energy and pushed for more stringent regulations to stop coal power generation in Chile. He has received awards from the UN Environmental Program, uh, the NASA, and the US uh, EPA among others. Uh, so I welcome Professor Mena. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm going to divide my talk into two uh, topics, one on methane mitigation, and then um, some, some of the things that I'm going to be presenting tomorrow, tomorrow for Congreso del Futuro uh, regarding Chile's energy transition, uh, which is somewhat related. So first thing I wanted to say, um, you, you, uh, Rolando was showing the picture from um, the, the prize from Katowice um, that happened for um, Aguas Andinas for that great investment. But that year, the, we had very little, um, little, little commitments on net zero globally. And the current, uh, the, the pledges there at that moment were leading to over three degree uh, warming overall. And it was very dark and it was, you know, you could smell the coal and many things like that. And, and, and things have actually changed and it's important to reflect on that because now we have most global economy committed to net zero. We have China and the U.S. collaborating uh, actively on climate uh, mitigation. And, uh, but the, the problem is that during that time, warming has gone from one degree with respect to historical values to almost 1.4, 1.2 almost 1.5 for 2023. So we have done more than ever, but at the same time, time is running out. And so that's why many people are thinking about short-lived climate pollutants that could help reduce temperature in the short term. This is not a, re a replacement of fossil fuel phase out at all. In many aspects, I think uh, the narrative of incorporating methane into the discussion um, gives you more reasons to phase out fossil fuel use faster. Uh, I just want to say that because it's not, a, it's not to um, stop action, actually, to accelerate action. So methane is short-lived. Uh, so therefore, it, if you stop the emissions, the effect of warming will actually um, stop faster than it was CO2 by itself. So if we reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030, as the Global Methane Pledge uh, establishes, that means we'll get twice the temperature reduction than decarbonization alone which is something we de near de uh, dearly because we need to stop as much as we can the warming to overcome the 1.5 degree threshold. Uh, so it has contributed to around 45% of net warming recently, and most of these emissions are also uh, from the last 12 years because the atmospheric lifetime of methane is very short. And that means then that actually 80% of the current emission, the warming that we feel from methane, has come from non-OECD countries. And therefore, the, the script of who it needs to take action changes substantially versus carbon dioxide, in which we know industrialized nations have contributed to most of the warming. Um, I, I'll tell you some things about uh, the, 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 the different things that Chile faces on this. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the, there is a study that shows by, by Swiss Re uh, that ha indicated that Chile may lose almost um, a fourth of the GDP by 2048, uh, depending on different warming scenarios. But on the other hand, 
in, in 2020, a study by the World Bank, when I was at the World Bank, uh, did a macroeconomic analysis of what net zero uh, meant for Chile in terms of job creation, growth, investment. And as you would think, a country that does not have their own fossil fuels, uh, the access to lower e em, uh, energy costs brings a, an, 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 a replacement of existing facilities into new uh, clean facilities, brings more growth than uh, the status quo. And there's another study by IDB that was done later that indicates that if our net zero target was 2040, we would even have additional uh, growth than, um, than we would only if we had 2050. At the same time, uh, these, these things, uh, when I, I gave a talk in Congreso Futuro almost four years ago, um, I, we were talking about how climate impacts could increase in Chile and how that is actually uh, hindering growth, so much so that the, the then Minister of Finance, uh, Felipe Larraín, started to uh, identify that many of the things that, the, that they were trying to do was undermined by climate change. And the growth of a, of a specific month could be impacted, for example, if you have a landslide in the Atacama Desert and impacting the generation of uh, mining uh, production. Well, this year, this last year, was one of the most climate impactful um, years in, in, in the history of the world, but for Chile it was particularly uh, difficult. Uh, so had one of the biggest uh, per capita GDP impacts, of course, but also uh, the, the, the totals were massive. You know, $2 billion in loss because of uh, flooding for the agricultural sector was, was very uh, important. The $1.3 billion lost because of the forest fires, that reaches almost 1% of GDP. And that's not considering uh, economic impact for uh, interrupted services. It does not consider the cost of flooding for homes. So I, I would say this is the last, the, the most impactful year that we've had on climate in the Chilean history. And it will get worse if, uh, if we do not adapt more. And this is really important uh, because uh, this undermines the fact that uh, very small, degrees change in difference can make a big difference in terms of the climate impact. So 2022, 1.2 degree warming, 2023, 1.4 degree warming, the difference was big. And so we have done, when I was in government, we would do the global survey, the, the national survey on, on climate and environment. We did many of them uh, to see how much support we had for some of the policies we wanted to do. Now at the Methane Hub, we did a global one uh, with uh, 17 countries. Um, that I'll show some comparison. But, the, but if you think about the things that people worry about today, uh, climate change is up there with many of them. This is not a coincidence. So crime is important. Of course, people are concerned globally about this. Inflation is important, even though decreasing. Uh, but climate change is one of the top three concerns in Chile. And if you look at the, you know, the, the other things, like climate change is threatening my life, you know, 92% uh, of Chileans uh, believe so. Uh, and you can see other countries in the world have very high concerns. Support for climate action to, uh, to prevent climate change, very high support also. And all, in, in, in the false dilemma of having to prioritize environmental protection or economic progress, this is still very high. I would say also a contradiction there is that European countries are actually the ones that are actually more concerned about economic growth versus climate action versus uh, emerging economies much more support environmental protection over uh, economic growth, which I, again is a false dilemma under my, uh, my vision. I'm going to step now talking into about methane, okay? So to me, methane in a way, um, the reason why I joined the methane uh, hub was because there's many sectors that were always elusive when we were working in, in the environment area. The energy system, we are in good path. We'll have 100% renewable energy sooner then later, uh, electromobility will overcome fossil fuel uh, use sooner than later, but we have no guarantee that our food system is aligned with the, the Paris Agreement, and that's one reason. And there's, a, there's this, this landfill that I visited. I took this picture. This is in the middle of uh, Delhi. Uh, there's a, you know, there's where the markets are, where they, they butcher the, the animals, etc. And this landfill, uh, which is around 20 stories high, it catches fire frequently. And this is a, a top political concern for uh, the, the president, and uh, because it actually uh, is undermines the image that they want to show of a clean city because it's under a black cloud of soot. 
And many people work there, and people die in that, but this is something that happens in multiple places in the world. And so, you know, you, you know this, uh, we, the organic waste, when it decomposes in, in the trash, it, it forms methane, uh, and as temperature increases, this is actually something that's more frequent. And so we've been able to track these, these, uh, these emissions uh, through satellite observations. This is an image from GHGSat with, that's able to, be, because the same reason that, you know, methane is much more, more potent than CO2 uh, at trapping infrared uh, radiation, the, um, this also makes it easier to measure. And so for many years, if you want to measure CO2, for example, the signal-to-noise ratio is not necessarily that, that clear. On methane, it sticks out very uh, clearly. And this landfill, for example, in Buenos Aires is, is 26 tons of methane per hour. This is over $20 million of natural gas lost every year because of uh, incomplete uh, capture of methane. And this is actually massive in terms of emissions, uh, you know, in terms of because a mayor usually doesn't have a lot of things that they could control, but they do control where the trash is going. And so therefore revisiting the waste management from um, the perspective of climate is something we need to be doing. For example, when we were, when we, when, when I was a student um, almost 30 years ago when I started, uh, the aspiration for a, Chile, a country like Chile was to landfill uh, waste instead of having open dumps. But now we know that uh, these emissions are massive, and this is actually calculated. I mean, this is uh, something expected, because a, a, a landfill only captures the best one, 60% of emissions, and 40% are lost, and that's what you see. So it's not like Buenos Aires landfill doesn't have a methane capture system, it does. This is by design, so therefore we need to revisit whether it's a good idea to cover up gases with, with soil. It doesn't make, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that there's some, some some, uh, some issues there. So it is the way that we could reduce warming in the short term. And, um, and I'll just tell you where these emissions come from. 40% come from fossil fuel extraction. This is something we see now. Uh, and actually emissions are much higher observed than what was previously declared officially. So the IEA, for example, has been able to see that uh, the reported values of emissions are actually 60% uh, sorry, the, the real emissions measured are 60% higher than what is self-declared. The other part comes from the food system, food production and food waste. And, um, you know, so just a, a little bit, my, my story, my, myself, I, you know, I, I, I was very frustrated uh, in the fact that I had been working on waste, uh, sorry, uh, air, air quality forecasting systems with NASA, and we track pollution across uh, the, the world, and this is uh, the... In, in Mexico City, you know, there's these two aircraft are measuring, and we would we would see where the where the plumes were being transported. But then, you know, we expected satellites to help us in in tracking pollution, uh, but they didn't really fulfill the promise then because of the, the what they were trying to measure and capture. But with the new technology, things have changed dramatically. And those who live in, in Chile understand that we had multiple conflicts associated to landfills during the time that I was in government also. For example, this, uh, this is the Santa Marta landfill that caught fire in 2016. And it was, it was very frustrating not to have any tools to prevent this ourselves. And you can't, you know, because we do many things to clean the air in, in Santiago because of better transportation, uh, banning wood burning stoves, and multiple things that you could do in the industrial sector. But this undermined everything. And the exposure to dioxins to the city was very massive that day. So this is something that happens in every country. When I started looking at my colleagues from Carbon Mapper, this is a landfill in, uh, in Los, Ange Los Angeles, you can see that was actually having high emissions and had a lot of complaints from the, from the neighbors. And when you could see where the leakage are existing, you could start doing specific interventions that could cover the, 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 the emissions uh, rapidly uh, and actually have better operational improvements that could be used. And so we decided uh, to take this model globally and uh, started to work with the major cities in the world and providing them the information of where these landfills are emitting. Uh, many of them are massive, like Mumbai is seven tons of, of methane per hour, Buenos Aires around 20. Santiago, um, you know, uh, actually has very decent um, emissions, and I'll show you some things that we've done in other landfills in Chile, too. So we put together the waste map, and, and you're welcome to go to wastemap.earth, where is, uh, it's a link of emissions, 
uh, landfill location, um, and satellite information. And it's a coalition of multiple NGOs that support multiple uh, cities uh, on this topic um, to be able to address those existing emissions and have policies that prevent new emissions from occurring, for example, with organic waste diversion. Uh, last year, in, we had a mission from, because this carbon mapper um, instrument is actually today in the International Space Station, but most of the measurements have been done by aircraft. And so we had uh, to, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, satellite will be launched this year, uh, along with methane that will provide m many more opportunities to measure. And so they measured all the landfills in Chile, and also some oil and gas extraction near Punta Arenas, in which there was high emissions too, and something to, we need to be looking uh, into also. For example, the, the trash that goes in, in here in Valparaíso and Viña del Mar is El Molle. Actually, the emissions are much higher than the one in Santiago, but treats maybe a third of the, of the trash. And so therefore, there's operational improvements that need to be done. And if you look at where these plumes are going, people live nearby. Therefore, those people are being exposed to bad odors, and we could do something to prevent that. Uh, Santa Marta, for example, uh, we were working with, the, with first off, with Veolia, with the, the first uh, group. And we're also working with the Santa Marta um, people to be able to look at better uh, operational changes that could prevent the submissions. But for example, uh, El Guanaco here, here, you know, it's a, which is actually in the region of Teno, many of you guys probably never heard of this landfill. Um, this is a, a landfill that probably serves 300,000 people, and it's almost one ton of CO2, um, one ton of methane per hour, which is uh, around uh, $6 million of natural gas lost uh, in itself. So therefore, um, we, we could actually improve this. And so we are working uh, in Chile, but also and working and supporting the government to do the organic waste diversion regulation. And this afternoon, we're going to meet with the parliamentarians that we're actually joined to support these actions. But as I said before, um, the, the, the cow is going to be the most difficult problem. Uh, and we are dedicating a lot of resources to this. And, you know, the, an animal uh, eats a lot of... Uh, food, this food, when it's suboptimal, when it's not efficient, when th there's much more emissions per, per animal. So an, an animal in Europe has high, um, you know, high quality food. Uh, the output of methane per milk is very, is very low in comparison to other ones in other places that are more suboptimal. When you, get, when you have a lot of uh, waste that you feed an animal, uh, the amount of methane that is, is generated is much higher. And so therefore, there's a whole bunch of things that we could do with different, uh, with different uh, locations in which we have a win-win, in which the improved feeding techniques allow increased yield and, in, and output for the farmer, and therefore that same animal could have much more uh, product and much more income. And so this is something we are doing in around 10 countries already. Uh, we have this uh, tool to help uh, local farmers identify the best optimal food sources to reduce emissions and actually provide better um, capacity to, to, te to teach the farmers on this. But the other topic, of course, is, uh, is, is, uh, is the cow itself. And so we did this uh, enteric fermentation research and development accelerator, understanding that today only 2% of mitigation in the agricultural sector is economically feasible. Today, there, it's not feasible to, today to reduce uh, um, methane in the agricultural sector, and so therefore we're dedicating a lot of resources um, that we have uh, got from Bezos Earth Fund, from Gates Foundation, among others. We put together a fund of $200 million of multiple different research universities that are going to be collaborating under a scientific guidance and oversight committee, uh, looking at three major things. Uh, studying the, the rumen microbiology better to identify uh, what makes a cow have more methane than another, identifying feed additives that will be able to change the way that we divert the, 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 um, the electrons from not being accepted as CO2 but have other different uh, electron acceptors like uh, bromoform from algae or from other uh, chemicals, even fatty acids that could just divert that, uh, or for example, vaccines that target methanogens uh, that will be able to have an animal that does not have necessarily uh, methane emissions uh, during its lifetime. So this is something that we are doing. We hope to have a lot of uh, reduction of cost um, uh, overall. But also, uh, many com companies are seeing milk and dairy as a reputational risk to their product. And so in last COP, we put together the Dairy Methane Action Alliance, which has the six major uh, dairy producers in the world, Nestle, Danone, uh, Heinz, um, and others, uh, groups, that, uh, Bell Group, and, and others, Lactalis. 
And they have actually committed to doing something very difficult, 30% reduction of emissions, uh, absolute reductions of emissions, and they also uh, have to have uh, higher outputs, and therefore they're investing. And Danone actually is one of the bi biggest and first investors in our operation in the Terra Accelerator. They're part of the board, and they will be adopting the technologies as soon as they're being implemented. So I think this is a change, because uh, when those who have worked with the agricultural sector understand that many times the response from the agricultural sector is we're carbon neutral, we're not part of the problem, uh, it's the oil and gas sector, leave us alone. And I think there's an opportunity to work here because, uh, you know, first off, because we can't do it without the agricultural sector having solutions, but actually there's a lot of benefits uh, to this, especially because I don't think the, the plant-based solutions have really had the traction that, you, uh, that we would want, and therefore we need other uh, solutions to be out there overall. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about, oil and gas sector. The oil and gas sector um, um, and the natural gas sector has become um, under more and more question. For a while, we've been looking into, you know, natural gas has lower um, CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour than coal if we only consider CO2 emissions. But when we look at upstream uh, extraction and leakage, if the leakage rate is actually higher than 3%, it, it, it's worse than coal. But if you actually think a little bit deeper, uh, the, the paper that show, came out by Deborah Gordon from RMI indicates that 0.3% of leakage rate is one that will determine whether it's worse than coal. And there's very little oil and gas extraction operations in the world that meet that threshold. This is because um, coal itself has a cooling effect because of the sulfate, and therefore, but methane from oil and gas has only a warming effect, and therefore that's the reason why this uh, analysis is a little bit more stringent. And so uh, we, the, it starts with making the problem visible. And, and you know, the, these cameras that are available, the same that we have the satellite information, these cameras allow you to see the methane leaks uh, faster. And we are funding multiple different NGOs to make those measurements and to use this for litigation because that is a tracer that also, it's not just methane, uh, it's not only just risky, but also it comes with other the co-pollutants like benzene that could expose the population locally, and so therefore it's a good um, opportunity for us to, to really um, uh, put more pressure and provide the tools for the communities to be able to defend themselves from these polluting operations. Sorry, i just go with the other one. Um, and so that's another, another uh, leakage that you can see. Uh, and this never gets old. You could do this anywhere in the world. We are opening, uh, overlaying our methane maps with uh, benzene exposure based on different extraction uh, compositions of different oil sources. And so therefore it's really important to, because this also helps us undermine um, the, 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 the sort of idea that natural gas is clean and clean, burns clean and, and nothing, and it's a transition fuel. It's not if we don't address these leaks. And so for example, here in Chile, uh, we are, we are um, looking into our transition and some want a transition that's long on natural gas. And, and Baca Muerta is one of the major new resources that has been uh, identified by Argentina. It's a, it's a national project that they want to uh, expand. And, but, but the pressure will be to stop those leaks. And if Argentina or any other country wants to access the European market, they will need to be able to show low leakage rates because the uh, European Union has established an import standard for, uh, for different uh, sources of natural gas that uh, reach the, the market. And the US, Australia, um, Korea, even Chile and, and uh, Japan have uh, signed in the context of APEC uh, an agreement to start link, uh, creating the basis for a low emissions oil and gas sector. And I think that's really important because that will put pressure on countries that don't necessarily have this as a priority. We also funded and, and helped create the methane alert response system, which is a really interesting thing that the International Methane Emissions Observatory from the UN has done. And so the premise is you see a leak right away, you contact the operator and to tell them to stop that leak because many times these leaks are invisible. This is the case in Argentina in which uh, a leak was detected and then was addressed uh, promptly. Uh, this, is, this is a sort of, um, you know, accident sometimes, but there's some other emissions that are actually uh, structural that occur constantly because it's, it's easier just to vent than to repurpose that gas for other reasons. And this pressure is really important. Uh, for example, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan 
have boi both joined the methane pledge, and basically it took maybe three, four articles in Bloomberg and Washington Post and multiple other places highlighting these high leakage rates. So this does work, and I think this is really important because this means that independently of you have a strong civil society or not, uh, you will have to meet these international regulations, and that's why uh, they have committed to stop those leakage. If, and it's something they will need to do if they want to access the market, for example, in Europe or in, in other importing countries. And so you could look at the methane response system. It's available. Uh, the, the multiplicity of different satellite platforms are available for this. So uh, the important thing here. Uh, and both of these guys are, are retiring, um, John Kerry and, and Minister Xie, uh, who are there with the COP president uh, the, from COP28, uh, and the president from the World Bank. We, we actually did help a lot of these agreements to be done. Um, the, we helped China have their methane action plan with the multiple technical um, assistance that the methane hub provided to, to different NGOs, and so the, the Chinese government likes to work with their think tanks, so basically, um, you know, we had multiple think tanks uh, be funded by these philanthropic funds. They reach their own conclusions with no, no intervention, and they have a methane plan. And that methane plan allowed China to go to COP and, and, and meet with Kerry and, and, and release before the COP the Sunnyland statement that said that uh, the U.S. and China will commit to including methane targets and short-lived climate pollutants in their next NDC. And so this methane summit uh, and the COP28 the COP summit ends with a declaration that says that we need to dramatically reduce methane emissions in the short term, and that means that there will be an expectation for NDCs to include specific methane targets overall. That's the end of the methane story. Now I'm going to go over uh, to Chile. Um, I just wanted to, to – this is – I didn't translate that one. But, yeah, um, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, uh, what hap has happened in the world, but it's also interesting to see what we thought was going to happen 10 years ago, right? And 10 years ago uh, in Chile, uh, there's a lot of conflict regarding hydro plants and coal-fired power plants being the solution to our energy uh, requirements. Um, and basically we had very expensive energy and an incumbent sector that was getting big profits and very little competition. And, and I, I gotta, we have to admit uh, that many of these things came from civil society. Uh, the, 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 the energy establishment itself did not necessarily see or believe the things that happened. And when Chile was discussing whether we should do Iduraisen, which is a big a hydro pro, uh, project or not, um, the, the, um, it, we needed external uh, uh, support to actually tell us there's a different way. And there's a study by Bloomberg New Energy Finance that indicated that um, we would have much lower cost if we were able to do something different than coal and hydro. And so we had a solution, and that was renewable energy. But the first thing, and I have to say, was just to say we're not going to do Uh because it was a big project. It was a, and, and in hindsight, I think anybody, everybody dodged a bullet uh, with this. If you look at projects like, like Alto Maipo, which is a big hydro project that started in, 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 in Santiago just recently, which is not operating today, which had um, costs that were maybe four or five times higher than they expected, and you know the the and probably a low level less cost of energy over a hundred dollars. Idraisen was the same fate. It would have been the same fate. It would have been you know it wouldn't be built. It wouldn't be connected. It would have been way more expensive than we decided to do. But we we did change uh, the, the 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 paradigm and we started a, a energy revolution, starting with a price on pollution. And many times uh, you know this is the World Bank's uh, map of different carbon pricing overall. Um, Yes, this year, Chile ha has a 10-year anniversary of having the green tax in law. But nobody's changed it. Everybody says the, the level is very low. It's $5 per ton. It's true that Cal uh, Canada, uh, Colombia, Argentina followed our lead, and they all started with five. But, but it's also true that you would expect uh, government to have updated the tax by now. And it's important that this government uh, actually delivers on the promise of setting a schedule for higher uh, carbon price down the line. But also, um, 
we did an emissions uh, standard. And, and, and so, uh, for example, here uh, worked with me and uh, another team to actually deliver all the background information that would allow the justification of an emission standard for existing facilities. And that actually changed things dramatically. This picture um, is a 2009 picture of the industrial complex of Tocopilla. Uh, the, this system had emission controls, but I, 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 I would talk to the operator that would write me saying, I wasn't in government, I was just a professor, but like they, they, they said, um, you know, we shut off the emission controls when there's no enforcement. Uh, because, you know, the incentives are, are to do that because you would, uh, you generate more power if there's no emission controls, right? You need to spend two, three percent of your energy output to, con to emission controls. And, and so I thought that was very cruel. The emission standard has continuous emission monitoring. So that means you cannot uh, do that again. You know, it's a, but also you have a carbon tax and a pollution tax that measures. So I was fascinated the first time that I went to, uh, to these installations in which you see power output, emissions compliance, and carbon uh, and pollution tax. And they, these are the three things and so the, that they need to uh, operate under. And I think it's in this operation, 2017, this plant is actually operating. It is operating. But, that act, but what we did first off was we did this actually made the capital cost of power generation be more expensive, right? So that meant that you, if you, the 30% increase in capital cost for existing or new facilities. The second thing was the carbon tax and the pollution tax was there. And even though it was only $5 a ton, nobody would project what the, what the price would be in the future. And if it does reach $30 a ton, that means that it will accelerate the shutdown of coal-fired power plants substantially. So no new coal was ever um, under discussion ever since this tax was there. Second, the third thing was to change the way that energy uh, was offered, in which we didn't have daily blocks, but you could offset the day and the nighttime, allowing uh, wind and solar to be offered. And it became apparent that it was cheaper to build a new solar facility or wind facility than continuing to operate an existing uh, 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 coal power. Or, uh, and therefore, the coal power was just a natural step because it was just cheaper to do something else. And I think this is something we should learn overall in, in when we think about climate action because the, what motivated this change was social was uh, locally environmental pollution issues, and it wasn't only climate. And many times we have this carbon tunnel vision that only allows us to think about one thing when we are missing out on opportunities to, to deliver multiple nails in the coffin of coal, uh, not just one, because for CO2 emissions, it wouldn't be necessarily enough. So since then, uh, we, have to say, we have to recognize that renewable energy sector has actually reduced the power emissions output uh, in, four, in, in 35, uh, 33% in four years. There's very few countries that have reduced that amount. We went from 55% coal generation to around, I think it's 13% this year. So very massive shutdown of coal. And, um, you know, 94% hourly uh, renewable energy, and there's a projection that we'll be, have many days with 100% renewable energy before 2030. And this comes with lower cost revolution that you've seen, but also, I, we have to really look at this other uh, revolution on battery storage. I think that's the one that's going to really go faster than we expect uh, because you, you, you see a big drop in, in less time even than, than in, in wind and solar. Uh, these are slides from RMI that, that, uh, from Kingsmill Bond that I, um, I'm using now. But this shows that actually if you look at 2022, 2023 reduction of cost, there's probably 30 to 40 percent just in that period. So therefore, that is a big revolution that's occurring. And so we could think about 100 percent renewable energy for Chile. And the premise here is that what we would otherwise spend on fuels that have, okay, uh, that, that would actually have like, um, you know, that, we, that would actually have a lighter price volatility to what we do, uh, actually could be replaced by investment, right? And so therefore, if this is not increased cost. This is increased investment opportunities when you phase out fossil fuels, and many stud models have been uh, looking into this overall. Uh, one slide uh, that I, I, I wanted to bring up from Gas uh, Engineering uh, that helped us actually, w was part of the, the, the emission standard in 20, 2009, 
uh, they have continued to this and they have been predicting many revolutions. And they actually say that you, know, you don't need a lot of, um, you could actually get down to 3%, 5% of, of uh, fossil fuel generation uh, by 2030 and, and you would, uh, 2035, and you would have uh, different investments that would be done, including battery storage and, and many things like that. So this should make us very happy, uh, but there's a thing I just, in Chile, that we've had that has changed a little bit of that discussion. Um, I don't think the whole environmental movement is aligned that this is the path forward. And it's important that we address why this is not extractivism 2.0 as some of the environmental movement have described this energy transition. And this is a slide from uh, Kingsmill Bond, which I think is really interesting overall uh, from RMI, uh, which tells you why it's just not the same. First off, commodities will never be free, and they don't have, they have decreasing returns, whereas technology-based solutions will always lower cost. The, the um, renewable energy is everywhere, whereas fossil fuel energy is concentrated in, in a smaller amount of uh, locations. We have a finite amount of fossil fuels, whereas uh, it's a very abundant system when you're talking about renewable energy. One requires, uh, that's why it will never be zero, always have to bring in that coal, ship that gas, et cetera, versus um, zero marginal cost is sort of the future of renewable energy in the end. Uh, one industry is uh, heavy, uh, and the other one is light, and you could see, for example, in places like Puerto Rico, in which this heavy centralized systems were highly impacted by uh, hurricanes, and a decentralized system uh, is much more resilient as a power system than one big uh, facility. One is obedient uh, electrons, and fire molecules actually are part of the natural gas transition, explosions that occur. Um, as we see uh, fa uh, older infrastructure for natural gas, you see leakage rates in Paris and in Texas, there's a hotel that exploded. This, this is something that we have to choose. Are we gonna fix those natural gas lines and who's gonna pay for that? Or are we gonna go to 100% uh, electrical solutions? Um, and it's, it, it's clear to me that we should probably uh, stop new uh, construction with uh, natural gas uh, being supplied and uh, uh, go for electrical solutions. One system, and we have to really undermine that, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, reinforce this. The fossil fuel era is inherently inefficient. 30% power output for internal combustion engine, 30% efficiency for coal in its best conditions. High efficiency of an electrical system is much better. One has environmental impacts, the, the one doesn't. One does not generate super profits, the other one is concentration uh, of oligarchs that actually keep the uh, world economy hostage every once in a while, and this is something that we, we need to go. And so therefore, the ultimate one is, the final one is, one distributes power and one concentrates power. So that's why we cannot l have this narrative that this is extractivism 2.0. We need to be aligned with one solution because we don't have a lot of time to waste and we can't be thinking about this overall. So if you think about it, coal, inefficient, uh, uh, you know, increasing efficiency of solar for, or, or wind, Heat pumps, three times more efficient than any uh, gas furnace. Electric vehicles with much less energy are able to go much further. And so I think that's really the big change. And just to, some short things that uh, reflection of, on what's going on in Chile on e-mobility. I think we have a story that's unique. Um, we have the largest fleet of uh, electric buses outside of China. It's no coincidence. The first thing is that we have very stringent emission standards to circulate in Santiago, so that means we're not comparing with low zero standard like Valparaiso, you know, uh, uh, car, uh, buses. We have from Euro 6, and then the incremental cost to going electric is, is actually lower. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the latest information I have is that there's actually maybe $50,000 of, of difference between a diesel bus and an electric bus, but one saves a system $40,000 a year, uh, so therefore, it's, uh, we will see 100% electrical buses. And this is something, and probably the only place in the world that it works without subsidies. This is absolutely just incorporated in the length of a, of a contract between the, the, the operator and the government, and they have uh, enough time to be able to pay for these investments. And so therefore, this is going to uh, you know, other places, like Coyhaique, like Antofagasta, but the model's different because obviously 
in Antofagasta or Coyhaique, the, it's so usually like one operator per bus, so therefore you have to uh, work with the fact that many of these providers do not necessarily have the economic backbone to invest uh, $300,000 in an electric bus, but the savings are substantial. Uh, we have some, already some interurban inter buses, and in the case of commercial vehicles with 80,000 kilometers per year, this already works with no subsidies, and you will see our, our major, uh, major brands like Chile Express or Mercado Libre are operating without any, any uh, subsidi subsidy on this. And Ubers, uh, if you go to Santiago, you turn on your, your Uber, you're gonna see Uber Green. Uber Green is basically, they just crack the financial uh, equation. Um, the, um, the savings that uh, are given to uh, the operator are just now a, a, a service, a financial service, in which the operator rents an electric car, and the sum of the electric use, electric car rent plus energy, is lower than if they had their internal combustion engine car with the gasoline. And so, therefore, that's why we have 500 of them. That's why they're not more expensive than other uh, vehicles because you're sending the wrong signal. If it's cheaper to operate, why would it be more expensive to rent uh, a Uber, right? That's electric. And so, therefore, I think these are really interesting things because the European Union, Green New Deal, billions of dollars, U.S. IRA, billions of dollars. Um, in case of China, also have a very strong industrial policy. These are all very, very important things that not necessarily reflect the operating budgets of nations across the world, which have multiple uh, spending requests, but don't have the capacity to be able to invest in subsidies. Um, and these subsidies many times are just, you know, bloating the price of things and makes things less comp competitive overall. So I think the, the, the model that Chile has established on renewable energy, on, on immobility, is replicable and useful in more places uh, because it doesn't require the big spending at other places. So the projections are, you know, first off, don't hear the people are saying, you know, electric cars aren't doing as well as you wanted them in, 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 U, in the U.S. and all these anti-electric anti car uh, uh, narrative. Actually, it's going way faster than was expected, first off. Second thing is the price parity is across you know, is going to be uh, very soon. The cost of price of batteries are actually um, going to even change this even more. And, uh, you know, there's already models that are, will be in, in Chile that are going to be low cost, are going to be available for people to use. And that way you don't have to have a luxury Tesla for electric car, but have something more representative of the cars that people drive in Chile, which are, you know, Chinese lower cost cars that this time will be electric. So why should uh, we aspire to 100% renewable energy? First off, you know, Stopping uh, fiscal pressure to subsidize fossil fuels. Um, every Chilean vehicle in 2022 received a subsidy of roughly $600 uh, because of the increase of, of fuel cost. $3 billion were spent on, on uh, subsidizing uh, fuels. And so th there's also cost price volatility and inflation. And so therefore, if we want to stop that, uh, it's important that we we stop, uh, we don't have uh, this, this uh, external price affecting our energy. In the case of natural gas in Chile, there's things that happened that showed natural gas is not the friend of renewable energy. One would be, first off, um, when they had the capacity, when they had to uh, deliver power um, and, and they, they, they had these take or pay contracts, they actually said that they couldn't shut off the, coal, the natural gas plants and that actually allowed maybe 20% of renewable energy to be lost because uh, natural gas was prioritized. I think that's a very anti-competitive measure that uh, shows that they are not the transition uh, fuel and allies of renewable energy. The second one is the moment that it was more uh, profitable for total energy to sell the natural gas to uh, France instead of the, fulfilling the, the natural gas import LNG for Chile, they decided to prioritize Europe. So again, we had thought that natural gas LNG terminals were going to keep us, uh, give us an energy dependence because we would be able to buy in a global marketplace when it's a moment of shortage. You're not in the prioritized, uh, 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 you know, versus Europe, and then you're stuck with the diesel again, and which is actually what we wanted to avoid. It's, um, it's actually transforming what we spend in future uh, in fuels into uh, jobs and investment and growth, and it's uh, you know a nationalist bet. 
but it's a nationalist vet that every country could do because this is a, a something that happens for 90% of the global population that imports uh, fossil fuels overall and do have the capacity to be able to provide their own energy with renewable sources. Uh, just a final comment. Um, things have changed on, on the methane agenda and we're putting it uh, on, the, on the global stage. For example, we had the Agricultural Food and Climate Declaration that was adopted by 150 countries in which we talk about mitigation for the first time. We have the climate and health in which we start looking into the, the importance of incorporating measures that were able to reduce exposure to pollution. Uh, natural gas industry, for example, or burning things in your homes increases uh, exposure to air pollution. The extraction of natural gas and others um, causes the exposure to benzene to the population, but also the ozone form from methane uh, actually increases the impact of, on, on, on population and reduces the productivity of soils also. And finally, the other thing that we were part of was the oil and gas decarbonization chap, uh, charter in which 52 countries and their national oil companies commit to near zero methane. And um, the good thing is it won't be self-declared. It will be something that we will be able to have an ecosystem to measure. Uh, that way we could hold uh, commitments to be accountable uh, in the real time. So thanks for your time and glad to answer some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mena, for the wonderful presentation. I want to open uh, the questions to the public. I don't know if there are uh, some questions. Uh, Professor Isaac. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation, very convi convincing. Uh, I'm working on the same line as you are, but uh, in a different environment. It's Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I have a harder time than, than you. Uh, we, we have done exercises uh, looking at uh, 2030, and we, kept, and we believe that uh, it's feasible and uh, to become 100% renewable in energy, but uh, people don't believe in that. And uh, you have a good argument in terms of gas, mm -hmm. how gas, uh, because people keep on thinking, politicians and uh, analysts, that you need gas to make it sustainable, and we believe that we don't, because we have 80% of hydro being delivered today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, this is in their minds. So what, what to do about this? It, it's hard because obviously there's incumbents that want to say things. I, th I think that there's good political leadership in, 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 in uh, Colombia. I hope that has uh, more uh, economic support because the thing is it doesn't help if you have, for example, um, a country that commits to stopping new exploration like they did uh, when, because if you don't change the uh, the way the economic incentives work, then it could be a change of government, and this will just be switched around. If you think about like the good transitions on renewable energy, they're, they're long standing, and so it doesn't matter, you know, if it's Trump or Bolsonaro, renewable energy still continues because there is the economic, uh, you know, force that will keep it going that direction. So. I think it's just more information because if you think about it, uh, any any developing any developed country would trade eighty percent, uh, you know, hydro that could be managed to be able to really uh, really go for one hundred percent renewable. There's no reason, right? And in Chile, we have maybe forty percent uh, hydro, and so therefore we it, we're, we will probably require a lot more uh, long term storage. So the long term storage uh, argument, I think, is the, is the one there. Um, and think about like pump storage as a solution to be able to, to use a cheap solar energy to, to, to make that hydro last longer. That's what I would do, I don't, I wouldn't know. Any other questions? Uh, Rodrigo? So, uh, Marcelo, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very good, very inspiring. I'm 100% um, uh, in line with your message. I think renewables is definitely the future. I just um, have a question regarding exactly what you said at the end. Um, long duration storage, mm. because uh, for short duration storage, we see that batteries are really uh, like decreasing the cost very fast. Mm. 
plus renewables this definitely will support the system towards you know expansion in the future for different uh, applications but uh, when there is no wind or sand then you will need something to provide security in the long term mm. and uh, you know i think in that point is when gas start like being a little bit more uh, appealing mm. in compared to other solutions mm. so i'm not sure what your uh, are your thoughts about this? I mean, I think we have to have long-term storage uh, solutions, right? Uh, days at a time, you know, multiple days. So, for example, the, the pump storage solution, uh, for example, uh, shows some promise, for, for example, with, with these pump storage so solutions. And, and probably we should start with existing hydro, right? We should, we should probably do that. I don't know why we're not doing it, but therefore we need to do the correct incentives. So we either have to have direct incentives and blocks for long-term storage within the government or have the correct par carbon price. But without either, uh, it's not going to work, right? So it's important that we either include the correct par carbon price, you know, aspiring to $75 per ton uh, by the end of, the, of this decade, plus uh, or, or do the, the, the blocks for long-term storage and provide the correct incentives for that o overall. That's the, the way that I would do it. Because the paradox is that, that if, if you know, I, I think this, you know, when we do it, did the first renewable energy auction uh, reform, I remember uh, even a former minister of, by, by Piñera, before she was a minister, she would say this is going to make things more expensive. And the, the paradox is actually no. If you, if you were able to, uh, the, the, the thing we need to avoid is having marginal costs defined by diesel, and that's, that's the real thing that we should be doing. And so therefore, uh, as long as you're able to create the proper incentives that deviate that and structure the, 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 the market as you, you need it to be done, uh, it, will, it will work out. If you give the, the electric uh, coordinator just, uh, just one task that doesn't have this uh, to be the, the, the carbon neutrality being as a priority, then they'll just do something that will be uh, contradictory and maybe uh, cause increases in cost. And so that's why, for example, the Coordinador Electrico needs to uh, not comment on whether they should be having climate change as a priority uh, because they are uh, a service to the political authority and it will be the political authority that will decide whether that happens and without... Yeah, so that's, that's, I don't know if you follow that discussion here in Chile, but basically the, the, the electric coordinator saying, you know, we shouldn't, prior, we shouldn't optimize for climate change necessarily. It shouldn't, we need to be a secure system that's cheaper. But, but we have a constraint, which is climate change, and it needs to be incorporated, and it's a political priority that they'll need to abide. Here and then, uh, Jenny. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, Yolanda, you have a mic? Uh, you talked about how um, civil society um, really uh, changed the conversation around um, climate and energy issues in Chile. And um, as a group of academics, I'm wondering, um, in your experience, both in government and um, academia, what can scientists um, do to improve communication between results of uh, modeling studies and uh, civil society groups? The, the story is interesting because um, it was it used to be the it used to be not anymore uh, that that uh, basically there are three or four um, energy economists that would define all the policies for Chile and they're they're experts and they're the ones that were consulted when in 2013 or 12 when they needed to do a first energy policy an energy policy by the way that projected almost zero solar by 2030 and uh, wrong from the very moment they published the report. Right, so so uh, I think the the interesting thing there, the other uh, you know, Professor Roman, uh, for example, um, who who was a pioneer, but he was a little bit uh, outside of the mainstream and therefore uh, was uh, sort of isolated from the economic establishment, uh, and so therefore their uh, solutions were seen as not serious, right? And so therefore I think, but in the end, um, civil society um, stood firm. And um, like Winston Churchill says about the Americans finally doing the right thing after doing all the wrong things, same thing happened with the energy system. We did all the wrong things until we could only do the right thing. We wanted to prioritize coal. We wanted to, uh, to do large hydro. And in the end, uh, the, 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 the power of the civil society was so strong that it shut down almost 12 gigawatts of coal and hydro. and um, that's some. That's probably who we should be thinking, thanking more. And be, and I think, uh, to, in the test, of, uh, the back in hindsight, um, 
being economically independent from the economic establishment and be able to provide uh, studies that do not have the influence of these incumbents is really important. Uh, and that's what changed the things here in Chile because that funding from Bloomberg New Energy Finance came from the environmental movement globally. Uh, and it wouldn't have got, come uh, from the local uh, universities. Thank you. Uh, Jenny? Hi, Jenny Haas, University of Canterbury, New Zealand. Thanks, Marcel, for a very great talk. Um, you mentioned a couple of examples of renewables of electric buses all without subsidies, and that's great. Yet at the same time, so at the same time we have huge subsidies of, uh, for fossil energies here in Europe all over the place. <laughs> so I'm trying to gauge is your perhaps personal feeling or conviction on when is it going to be the year we finally phase out those fossil subsidies? Are you confident? Yeah, I mean, the thing is we have to do it smart. And no, no country that has tried to change uh, the, fossil, uh, the subsidy reform has been able to do it uh, with the correct plan to implement. I remember when I was at the World Bank, um, the minister from Ecuador came and uh, talk, met with my boss, Kristalina Georgieva, and they shook hands. They were very happy. They were going to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. And then they got, and they had a really strong arguments. Uh, the, you know, Ecuador spends more money on fossil fuel subsidies than on uh, health and education. Very strong arguments. Um, but they, they took them out fast, and we had, you know, same as France with a yellow vest. So I think if you don't, if you don't do it with, like, the correct... Uh, divide and conquer tactics in which you have some winners and some losers and not only losers, that's going to be the way to do it. Uh, one mistake that the Chilean government did uh, with, when they're announcing their new tax reform for fuels was that all fuel taxes will rise. But really, the ones that need to rise more is diesel, right? And so, and that that's only pertains to maybe 50% of the vehicles. So, of course, it would have been much smarter to actually uh, only re uh, increase the price of diesel. And if you want to be even more... Uh, more uh, p uh, like uh, pragmatic, lower the fuel of gasoline, right? And, and, and make that, that's a viable change in which you have 80% of people in favor and maybe 20% against. If you want to do a reform in which 80% of people are against, it's going to be a failure. And so, for example, now with, with, uh, with Chile, for example, with the energy price, if we were to introduce a carbon price, you would actually probably the smartest way to do it is to do uh, targeted residential on-grid uh, on subsidies that will have the majority of the population experience lower energy costs and have those who can pay more, uh, pay more. That's the only way to make it viable. But nobody's done it, so I can't say that formula is, is going to be a winner. Thank you very much. I agree. Very exciting talk. Probably the most exciting talk I ever heard about methane. <laughs> uh, my question is the following. When we you know, change everything towards renewables, and I'm pretty sure that nobody here wants to debate about this, and we go towards more electrification, mm. something that I found was probably a, a bit missing in your, in your mm. presentation was, uh, what about the grid? Mm. And do you have any forecasts in Chile of how much uh, will be the grid cost expansion and reinforcement to follow uh, this electrification and renewables uh, shift? I, I think others are, are more, more, more um, equipped for that. But I do believe that uh, the cost, for example, that I've seen is it's not massive cost uh, versus status quo. Many times battery storage could cover uh, the, the lack of transmission and probably will be cheaper. Uh, and the changes are, if you think about how things are playing out in Chile, it's exactly that. Nobody's doing no uh, 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 solar in the north anymore unless you're doing for something for, I mean, no, not new facilities because you have no capacity to transmit. Uh, the major sources are actually in central Chile uh, and the capital, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the, the solar capital, I would say, of Latin America today is the uh, region del Maule, in which you have, you know, a large energy demand uh, and you have the, the consumption and the location of, of the of the generation in the same place. And you will see within these next two to three years, uh, all those solar facilities having battery storage that will be offered around at $50 per megawatt hour, which is my projection, uh, at, which will be cheaper than the majority of the different other fossil fuel uh, relationships. So yeah, transmission could get difficult, uh, but, uh, but I think battery storage will be, break a lot of uh, paradigms on, on, on that. But I'm not an electrical engineer, so maybe I'm wrong. We have time for one final question uh, over there. So 
thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. I have a question about, uh, because you mentioned, yeah, that uh, waste was an important contributor to methane. So what other solutions uh, you visualize for food waste? Like, and what's your opinion in particular for incineration or um, waste to energy? Yeah, so, so we had, um, so first off, there's many activists on energy that are very good allies for us. There's not a lot of activists on solid waste management, unfortunately. And there's one big group which have a very important agenda, uh, which is the Global um, Alliance, uh, Anti-Incineration Alliance, Gaia. And when we work with them, we developed what would be the principles of environmental justice in which we, you would operate under and in which the fossil solutions of landfilling and incineration are not promoted. Countries could do it, have different considerations. For example, in Denmark or in other places that you have a high energy demand, maybe it makes sense, right? But in developing countries like, uh, like India, in which the, you know, the organic waste proportion is very high, uh, you don't have a lot of heat demand, these end up being very expensive solutions that are much more expensive than organic waste management, for example. You're talking about, $100, $150 a, a ton of, 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 uh, of trash being incinerated as a, as, a, as, a, as a cost versus landfilling being 20, uh, composting being 20, uh, 30, and anaerobic digestion may, maybe 50. So I think that's one, one, thing, one reason why we should be thinking differently. The solutions that I, I see are the following. Reducing food loss and waste, right? For reducing it, uh, you know, uh, in developing countries, 30% of food is, never reaches the market. So therefore, uh, having better, for example, uh, animal husbandry to increase the, decrease the loss of milk, for example, is really important. Uh, the, around 50% of all the emissions uh, of the food system come from food that n nobody ate, right? So it's 33% of the food is lost, but then you add all the energy lost in that lost food, it's around 50% is that. And it's become part of an agenda. So the COP CBD in, in Colombia will have and take stock of how much is being reduced in food loss and waste. And there's a new funding facility that philanthropy is putting together to reduce food loss and waste. Food banking is the other, other, another way. Food banking, you know, to have just uh, eliminate the incentives to destroy food uh, uh, and actually use them. I think those are going to be cheaper than, than incineration, uh, which is, and I, I don't think is a good solution at this stage. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have no time for further questions. So, <laughs> yeah. so with this, I want to close uh, the session. Uh, but I want to invite you all to the terrace. We will take a group picture of the conference, and then we'll go for lunch. Okay? Yes. Thank you so much.